Thank you. We are back on the record in State versus Jesse Kershevsky. Appearances are as they were before. Uh, court has reconvened after the lunch hour to uh, pronounce sentence in this case. Before I pr pronounce sentence, though, I, I do want to go through some of the remarks that were made here today and my impressions of this case, this trial, and the jury's verdict. Not commenting on their verdict, but we're here today, first and foremost, because there were three jury verdicts in this case, three guilty verdicts, one for intentional homicide and two for theft. And that, of course, was the culmination of a case that was initially filed in June of 2021. Of course, not the start of the investigation, not the start of um, legal problems for the defendant. I'm well aware that ultimately in 2019, you were revoked in part due to allegations related to these charges. And it was basically upon your discharge the day before that this case was filed. Now, from my perspective, not only was this a very unusual case due to the allegation of a poisoning uh, by an over-the-counter substance found in Visine. It was unusual because of the amount of time that was put into the investigation. I don't think anyone watching this trial, sitting in this courtroom, or even watching, you know, summaries of it, was surprised that in October of 2018, the death investigation, which was very normal, uh, Any time someone was found deceased outside of a hospital setting required a death investigation. I don't think anyone was surprised that initially people on scene thought it was a suicide. That's the call that came in. That's how uh, really the scene looked. I think it was Detective Loberg who said there were no signs of forced entry. He looked outside. He looked inside. There wasn't anything to suggest any type of external trauma. He'd been on overdose cases uh, in the past. You know, there weren't any syringes found or anything like that, but there were the crushed pills and some other things. And I think that scene was made to look a certain way for a reason. On the one hand, the defendant wants us to believe that this is all a big mistake, that this was a suicide. And of course, the state presented a case to a jury with a lot of evidence, and a jury found that it was not a suicide. And I'll be more specific. They were not asked to determine whether it was suicide. They were asked to determine whether it was a homicide. And of course, if a jury believed it were a suicide, they would have found you not guilty. That would have been their reasonable doubt. But that's not what they did. But that investigation, like any investigation into a death, doesn't happen overnight. Doesn't happen in a vacuum. Samples are taken from the body, and those samples are ultimately tested. What I think is really interesting for me is that somewhere along the way, a very astute scientist thought it was important enough to ask NMS labs, and it's I'm sure one of their scientists, to include in their expanded panel tetrahydrazoline, an over-the-counter, well, a drug found in over-the-counter medication. I don't want to say it was a trend, 
But I know when listening to the testimony of Dr. Kosinko, she said one of her responsibilities was to look for trends in drugs. And even when we listened and heard Dr. B testify, she talked about how while this may have been the first poisoning she had seen through tetrahydrazoline, it was not the first time she was faced with looking at something novel or new as part of her job. I mean, scientists do this all the time. They take known information, known data, known research, and when faced with something not seen before, they render opinions, they extrapolate. That's how medicine grows and advances are made, whether it be by pathologists who are medical examiners or cancer researcher. And if you kind of flip it around and think about cancer research, we would praise someone for that type of work. And so unbeknownst to everyone in this courtroom, in 2018, tetrahydrazoline was not something we expected to find. It was not something any of these detectives knew was even going to be screened for. It was not something the medical examiner knew to screen for. And I do believe it was something you, Ms. Kershevsky, banked on no one testing for. As you know, I sat through this entire trial, and not just this trial, but obviously the entire case, presiding over a variety of motion hearings, including the Daubert motions, where we, I, I heard from a couple of the experts and made some rulings. And I know you take issue with a lot of my rulings, and I will gladly, gladly challenge those. You can challenge those on appeal. I'm one person sitting up here doing the best that I can, given the law and the facts that are before me. And if, whether it's three individuals on the Court of Appeals, if that's appropriate, or all the way up to the Supreme Court wants to review and tell me I got it wrong, I am human, but I don't think I got it wrong in this case. You may not agree with the decisions that I made, but let me tell you, I did my utmost to ensure that you had a fair trial. Every step along the way, wanting to make sure if I delayed something, you were okay with it because I knew, because you made it abundantly clear, you were waiting for your day in court. And you and I had a number of colloquies or conversations in this courtroom or other courtrooms about the delays. Because honestly, I wanna make sure that any trial, especially a homicide trial, is done right the first time. It's of no benefit to anyone if a trial, if convictions get reversed on appeal. It happens sometimes. There's advances or new evidence or whatever the case may be. You complain, for example, about my protective order. And I think little do you realize, not only did I put that in place for the integrity of these proceedings, it was put in place to protect you. See, I've sat in the shoes of Attorney Jones. I didn't like when there were surprises. As an attorney, as a defense attorney, I wanted to control the narrative as best as I could to protect my client and his or her rights. Now, when I was on the other side, in the state's table or at the state's table, I used to train police officers on confessions. I love confessions. Why do I love confessions? Makes my job easier as a prosecutor. So I have this unique ability that really not a lot of judges have to look at both sides and now really the third side as a judge and kind of see what's going on. And so every time you make an extra statement, you complicate things for your defense team. That's your right to do it. But I wasn't going to have that happen until this case. I, I didn't want to have extrajudicial statements, meaning outside a court trial, or in this case, a sentencing as well, that could impugn the integrity of these proceedings. It's not good for you. It's not good for the case. I want to make sure we have a jury that's fair and impartial. 
And in this particular case, there were extra steps taken because of the interest. You may not have, I guess, liked, I'm gathering from your statements here today, that there were cameras in the courtroom and that this was on court TV and law and crime and other things. But here's the thing. I learned during and following the pandemic when we shut down courts or at least limited them to a great degree, what I learned is I started doing live streaming because that was a way for people to still be engaged, to watch what's going on, to keep our courts open and operating during a time of uncertainty. People were very interested. The court system and the legal system is critiqued and criticized all the time for not being transparent. So by having cameras in the courtroom, when there is that interest, I believe it fosters transparency. It's not about sensationalizing this. I did a very, very extensive trial order on that to make sure that didn't happen. You're not wrong that there's an interest and that people do different things with that interest. We are seeing trials televised more and more. People are fascinated with the legal system. I had a request and I granted it. Nothing more, nothing less. But some of my rules and requirements were meant to make sure that nonetheless, things were fair and impartial. Fair and impartial doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything that I do. Fair and impartial doesn't mean you're going to agree with how a jury decides this case, how it's investigated, how it's presented. There's a lot of law on evidence. There's a lot of case law, volumes of it, on what comes in, what doesn't come in. Some of those rules impacted evidence coming into this case. Other things are beyond my control, whether the state chooses to offer something or not, or whether your own attorneys choose to offer something or not. But a courtroom isn't a free-for-all either. I do my very best to ensure that relevant evidence comes into the courtroom and reliable evidence. So I sat through this case 16 days of trial from beginning to end, not including sentencing and any of the things that happened following the conviction. 36 witnesses. We had four expert witnesses, two pathologists, a uh, pharmacologist, um, and then a toxicologist. And they heard a lot about tetrahydrazoline. What I learned about tetrahydrazoline is how it affects the human body. I had the criminal complaint, obviously, all throughout this case, but until a case goes through the trial process, I don't really know what all is going to come in. I have a good idea, but I didn't know the breadth or the depth of it. I didn't know other than filings, for example, with the medical examiner and the Daubert motions. You know. I, that's the first time I really got a lot of that information with substance. And a lot of times I don't even have that information until there's a trial. But what did I learn? What, what is tetrahydrazoline? I think at its simplest, it's a sedative, right? It's a, it's a substance that when used as approved for eye drops or nasal spray, it constricts. Right? So it helps people breathe who have nasal congestion and it helps with redness in the eyes. It is not approved for oral use. What do we know from the literature that's out there that predates this case? Some of it obviously coming in around or even after is that there's really only two types of ingestions that are seen in the literature. Accidental or malicious. 
no known literature about people dying from voluntarily ingesting it for a suicide. Why is that? Because that's a big question that I've I think needs to be answered. And that's because I think it's the last way anyone would ever commit suicide because of how it affects the human body. It makes people sick. You weren't the first person to think about tetrahydrazoline. There have been movies and even Law and Order episodes, or an episode that I happened to see at one point, where there's some poisoning. We know from Henry Spiller, your own witness, he encouraged the FBI to look into it or get it on a list because of its use related to sexual assaults, that malicious ingestion, right, a poisoning. But like I said, at its core, it's a sedative. And, and how does it affect the system? Um, during Dr. No, I think it was uh, Ms. Kasinko's. Uh, testimony. She talked about how it in when ingested, and I, obviously unknowingly, right? It's odorless, it's tasteless. You can give it to someone without them ever knowing it. It can reduce inhibitions. It cr it creates uh, causes someone to be lethargic. Um, it has a significant impact when in large amounts that shouldn't be in one system on to CNS depressant, right? So ultimately it affects breathing and heart rate and brain functioning and can lead to death. After listening and seeing and reading through all the evidence, just like the jury did, and I don't know what they ultimately, or why they ultimately concluded it's a homicide. They don't have to explain their verdict. They just render a verdict, all having to agree. But as I saw everything, I have to ask out loud, it's in a rhetorical question, but were you poisoning Lynn Hernan all along, following your release from prison? No. I'm not asking for an answer. This is my time. So do not interrupt me. She got markedly sicker following your reinsertion in her life on a daily basis, ultimately ending up in the hospital in September of 2018. Unexplained. Couldn't figure out what was going on. But what do we know? She got better. What could not have been happening in the hospital? Someone poisoning her with THZ. Too much risk associated with that. Cameras, whatever it may be. And I think that gave you the green light. You said I went undetected because what I think was happening is that you were using it to control Lynn Hernan, to steal from her to gain control of her accounts. And I think you targeted her. I agree with the state's assessment on that. The perfect victim. No children, no parents, they were deceased with a fair amount of money. Why do I say that? Well, your past matters. Your past convictions for forgery, uttering, and misappropriation of personal identifying information matter. Because I'm a big proponent and believer that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. That's not to say people can't change. But we know you targeted people. And from my perspective, some ver in a very aggravated way, because you, it's real easy to say, well, those convictions happened in 2011 and this didn't happen until 2018, but you were revoked once following being in prison for about a year. It was one year of initial confinement, three years of extended supervision on each of those counts. You get revoked, in, so you're sentenced in 2011, 
you're released in 2012, you're revoked in 2014, you go back to prison, I think it was about 26 months or so, you're released again in February, late February of 2018. And it's shortly thereafter that these thefts start happening. And it's shortly thereafter that Lynn Hernan gets sicker and sicker. Now, I'm not sentencing you here today because I think you poisoned her all along. I'm sentencing you because a jury convicted you of a homicide based upon that. But I think it's important for everyone in this courtroom to know that's what I see. And that's what the evidence points to. Very planned, very deceitful. Maybe it wasn't your intent to kill Lynn Hernan. I don't know. Do I believe this was a suicide? Absolutely not. There's a lot of holes in the stories that you have told. I think you think you're smarter than everyone in this courtroom. All of your statements come after you get information that you now have to explain. Those letters, no way Lynn Hernan wrote those either herself or willingly. Or willingly. And I think that's supported by the thefts in this case. It's supported when you understand the, how tetrahydrazoline affects her, affects individuals. And that why do people choose it for a, uh, to assault someone? Because it can impair them. It can make them lethargic. It can make them lose their own inhibitions. It really, in those circumstances, with that malicious intent, is to control someone. I think the evidence points pretty squarely to that. I am not going to go through every single piece of evidence. I'm not going to go through every single witness. But it's important to really lay this, set the stage, so to speak, for why I believe um, not why I believe, but for how I'm going to sentence you here today. And really to respond to some of the things that you, your mom, and others have said on your behalf. You know, it is one thing to maintain your innocence. I, su I support the jury system. I support people making the state prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's what makes the system that we have in the United States so great. I'm not here to tell you it's perfect every step along the way. We're a system filled with human beings. But I don't see this as one of those cases where it's just an all out, let's get Jesse Kraszewski. There's no reason for anyone here to make anything up. You are the common denominator that brings all of us here today. It is your actions, not theirs, and it's not Lynn's. I find it interesting that you criticize people like Anthony Poza, Corrine Poza, Jim Kelleher, and others for not knowing Lynn, for not getting her help for, you know, you criticize them for saying, well, she wasn't suicidal. They didn't know her. They weren't close to her in the last year of her life. But ironically, you want us to believe all the statements that you've made, and yet you'll back off and say, but I wish I could have done more. I wish I would have seen more. I, I have these regrets because I didn't get her more help. I don't think you can hold those beliefs together. I think they're opposed to each other. I think it's a convenient position to take when you criticize them 
And yet you can't go so far as to say, well, I saw it all. You have to stop short of that. Otherwise, you couldn't claim that you didn't know she was suicidal. And of course, we know that story changed over time. You are, I think, very upset over this thing about Whitnall Park. Here's the thing. You were in custody, okay? I don't know if, it's very, very rare for police to take someone out of custody. But what they did was pretty amazing. They got you on what we'd call a FaceTime call, some type of video from their conference room at the jail to direct individuals. You want us to believe this evidence that exonerates you exists. And yet you had what, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, up to July 8th, at any point in time, to go get it, if it really existed. You had all the opportunity in the world to make sure, if that evidence existed, to secure it in a way that was accessible, not in the ground, at a park. Doesn't make sense. Same thing really with the letters that happened to show up after Lynn died. When were those turned over? Again, rhetorical question. I even listen to how you talk about the will and the wills and how this whole test thing with Anthony. Here's the thing. The initial will that was submitted to Judge Maxwell was typewritten and witnessed by strangers at a bank. You want us to believe that Lynn Hernan changed her will and didn't follow the same procedure that she did for the will that was initially admitted into probate and what stood. By the way, a will can't be witnessed by the beneficiaries, would never have worked. If she were that suicidal and making all of these plans to kill herself and change her will, Lynn Hernan was smart enough to know how to do it the right way if in fact she was the one to do it. You have someone draft it and you have neutral witnesses, like she did the first time. You go to a bank, you get it notarized. That's not what she did. There are a lot of holes in your version of events. And here's the thing, I didn't get the ability, nor did the jury, to have your story tested for its veracity you have the absolute right at a trial not to testify. And there are pros and cons to doing so. You claim to regret not testifying. But the jury didn't get to hear that. That was your choice. That's not on me. That's not on the state. That's on you. The other thing I want to comment on, you want us to believe that you and your mom were so close to Lynn Hernan that you loved her and cared for her more than anybody else. And yet you unabashedly throw her under the bus and impugn her character with these wild stories. You want us to believe that she killed herself 
because she killed her mom in the same way that she was killed. And again, poisoning oneself with Visine drops would be the last way someone would commit suicide. It does not. There's no known literature support for tetrahydrazoline causing a state of euphoria and pain relief and sleep. Uh, I should rephrase that last one. Making someone fall asleep. I suppose it could because of the effects as a CNS depressant, but the other effects on the digestive system and making one sick, again, no way. I think that's probably why a jury rejected because perhaps they came to that same conclusion that it just was not believable. Oh, the one other thing I wanted to comment on because you referenced it as well was the fact that you couldn't, didn't or couldn't review the restitution information. It's a pretty standard order that I get. It's a request for an order from the state due to victim rights legislation and the constitutional amendment to seal restitution information. But the order that I signed says that parties to the case are permitted access. You're a party to the case. Whether your attorney chose to give it to you or not, I don't know. I want to refocus this because what we're here today is really about giving voice to the one person who cannot speak today, and that's Lynn Hernan. It's about honoring her life and punishing you as the person found legally responsible for her death. She cannot respond to any of the accusations that you and your mom have levied against her. She's gone. And you've taken away from your own life, but for Anthony and Kareen and Jim and Keith and all the other individuals, a bright light, as Anthony said, extinguished far too soon. You took that away. You took away future memories, birthday parties, luncheons, phone calls. You may have been with Lynn that last year or so of her life, but what do killers sometimes do? They target their victims, they isolate them, they control the narrative, they stay or show up at scenes. I mean, the bottom line is homicides generally don't make a lot of sense. It's the taking of another life intentionally. It defies all notions of goodness and decency. They don't make sense. And sometimes they're wild and crazy. And people like you do strange things things. I believe for the sole purpose of trying to get away with it. I do believe you thought you had found the perfect way to take Lynn Hernan out, that it would go undetected. And again, maybe that wasn't initially. Maybe it was just to control the finances, to take her for the money that she had. But I think when she got to the hospital in September, and no one at that hospital found that substance, and you were getting to the end of the money, and really the only thing left of value was that condo. Lynn Hernan was better to you dead than alive, and you thought you could get away with it. You know, when I sentence individuals, there's a number of sentencing criteria they fall into three main categories, the seriousness of the offense, the need to protect the public, and your character and rehabilitative needs. Your character includes who you are, 
sitting here before me, the good, the bad, the indifferent. It includes your past convictions. They are important, especially as it relates to counts two and three, because there's a pattern in your life of taking advantage of people, whether it be your mom, your grandmother, whether it be uh, patients in a clinic that you work at or the mother of a friend you're living with. And you explain it away as, well, I had a gambling addiction. I just wanted to live. I needed a place, a roof over my head, however you described it in those moments. I think you thought you were a very good thief and that you, well, let me go back. So I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, I don't think you have any redeeming qualities. I mean, obviously, while in the jail, I think you've tried to do what you can to make the most of unfortunate circumstances at your own hand. You obviously very diligently review all of the discovery materials. You do what you can to do your own research, to educate yourself. You help other inmates. I think you were blessed to have maybe some additional money coming in on your canteen and you uh, will help individuals who don't have any. I don't even frankly care what the motives are, whether they're purely good motives or if there's a pecking order back there, I don't, I don't know. But I do know you, have, you made a friend and she said some very nice things about you today. Honestly, the only person, I was really hoping to hear more from your mom about you. I have a lot in the PSI and the private PSI about that, but your mom spent every moment of her statement attacking everyone else in this courtroom and Lynn. Whereas Ms. McCarthy came in is what we hope for and expect of character witnesses to tell me more about this other side. Because I, I do believe people are multifaceted. People have many sides. Even in the worst cases, like a homicide, there are redeeming qualities. And she told us about those. And I thank her for doing that, about how you took her under your wing. You kind of developed this relationship. You had lunch together, meals together, prayed together, did some studies together, and you helped her through a very trying time, as she said, being 70 and never incarcerated before. I'm sure that was not easy. And so I, I think there is a side to you that does care. I don't want you to think that I, I don't think you have a caring side. I mean, clearly you do. You cared for Scott Craig, you cared for his children, and in your own way, um, you made them feel important and loved. Now, there was another side to you, and I think he got it right when he described you. I mean, he, I think there was a reason you never introduced him to Lynn Hernan. I find that interesting. She clearly, if I were to believe the letters were written by Lynn, she wanted to meet him, but yet she never did. I don't think you wanted there to be any possibility of questions. And that's why I think however you did it, you were able to get, keep Lynn isolated so that other people wouldn't question and perhaps uncover what was happening with the thefts. I know that you still have the strong support of your mother. Um, I question at times whether that's healthy or not. Um, if she's seeing things clearly, I think she's, you know, one of the few individuals who has you know, really bought the story, lock, stock, and barrel, that you have spun. Um, I think as a mom, we want to always see the good in our children and don't want to believe the worst, and it's really challenging and difficult to believe that your own child is capable of a homicide. It's either that 
or she's complicit and she knew and she was involved. I don't know. The seriousness of these offenses um, are significant. As a homicide, there's a loss of life. It is intentional. You are convicted of intentional homicide, not, for example, um, what some people might call manslaughter or even assisted suicide. And I know you probably don't agree with the decision that I made on that either, and that's okay. The law just did not support it. But here there was an intentional poisoning with a very specific intent for it to go undetected over time to cover up your thefts. It's aggravated in the sense this was a planned series of events. This was not, you know, a crime of passion, for example. You have a relatively minor record, even though there's four felonies. You don't have anything other than that. You didn't have issues as a juvenile. Um, but there were thousands and thousands of dollars that were stolen by you before Lynn Hernan was killed and after. And it's all really related in terms of the seriousness because you really don't have one without the other because I do think the homicide was related and the motive uh, was to cover things up. It was to not get caught and to do it in a way that you thought you could do to get away with it. I talked about the scene a little bit, and I think it's, I think there's some aggravated factors about that. The way that scene looked, Dr. B talked about her opinion. She testified that she thought it was staged, or, she was concerned about it. Um, it was not something she had seen. And, you know, whether the body was moved or the tray was on her chest before or after, there were pieces that appeared to be pieces of pills strategically placed in the corners of Lynn Hernan's mouth. I think it's inescapable that they were placed there. None found in her mouth, but only in the corners. I somewhat agree with you that through the transport, through the EMS people being there, some of those things would have fallen on the floor, would have been scattered in other ways, and that's very possible. I just don't think that would be responsible for those pieces in the corners of her mouth. These were crimes over a significant period of time. These were crimes that required planning, preparation, Once Lynn Hernan was killed, the amount of deceit and deception really accelerated. We have these letters. Even if I take those off the table for a minute, we have everything that was done in that probate case. The false invoices, the loan against the inheritance, and then using the estate funds to pay back. I mean, those were things that, from my perspective, were pretty easily proven. That paper trail. That was dismantled pretty quickly.
And then we get to the point in time where police now, law enforcement are now zeroing in on you. We know in about March when you met with Detective Cole and Detective Hoppy that, um, and that really only happens after you make some phone calls and you're told the ME's office, they're not going to talk to you anymore. However, that kind of worked itself out, but we know they reached out to you because you called uh, there's a recording of your call seeking information from them. And that's kind of, a, I think, a pivotal point because I think for you, you knew something was going on. They didn't tell you at that point. They don't tell you until July about the THZ. But that would have been a really good time if you had evidence that Lynn Hearn committed suicide that you raise it, that you bring it forward. Or that if it did exist, you get it out of Whitnall Park, you put it in a safe deposit box, you put it in a storage, you put it someplace other than a park if it truly existed. There were so many opportunities for that to be brought to police. And yet, and this is where your character comes into play, you want to turn the tables on law enforcement and say, you didn't do enough. You should have taken me out of custody. I should have had those two weeks to go search to find it myself. You didn't even have as much of a photograph on your cell phone to say, here's where it is. I, I kept a document. I kept a record of it just in case. Nothing. See, all things that I think, if this were legitimate, someone would have done or had. So fast forward to July of 2019. Six different interviews. Six different versions of events. And not one really making a whole lot of sense. You yourself admit, I lied. You should not be shocked, Ms. Kershevsky, that people don't believe the stories that you tell. They don't add up. They don't make sense. They fly in the face of logic. They are far too convenient and most often have extra detail added after you're given information from law enforcement, as if you went back to your cell, how can I explain this away? And I think you rely far too much on your intelligence and your ability to think on your feet, thinking you can outsmart law enforcement. And the thing is, they're gonna look at everything. They're gonna uncover everything that they can You want everyone in this courtroom to believe you should not have been convicted because law enforcement didn't look into the death of Lynn's mom. They didn't need to. They had enough evidence. The evidence was clear. It pointed directly to you. But you had an opportunity, I think, many times to accept responsibility, to just admit. And I think, I don't think you're able to do that. You're going to stand firm on this was a suicide, and no one will convince you otherwise. But you know what you did. You know you're the one that took Lynn Hernan from this earth. You know you're responsible because your own words say that to me. I knew she was drinking Visine. I helped her. I was filling up the bottles. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not going to get it exactly right. But your story morphed to the point you admitted 
You knew Lynn Hernan was suicidal, that at one point she put a gun to her head, and that she had been drinking Visine for months. If that were true, and you love this woman with your heart and soul and cared about her well-being, I believe Lynn Hernan would still be here because you would have gotten her help. You would have told her other friends and family that you may not have had a lot of contact with since you got out of prison or even ever, but you certainly knew about them. You had access to Lynn's phone. You would have reached out to everyone and anyone and said, this woman needs help. She's suicidal. But that's not what you did at all. I know you think that I came into this courtroom today having made up my mind on what to do in your case. I gotta tell you, I didn't. I would go back and forth. Should I give her life without the possibility of extended supervision? Should I give her this eligibility at some point in time? I, I even made myself a, a sheet and I had blanks. For those things. Now, I knew what I wanted to do on the theft charges. I'll give you that because those are pretty simple. They're 10 year felonies. The max is five years each, five initial confinement, five DS. And really, the issue was should they be consecutive or concurrent? And I'd go back and forth. You could, I, I'd talk to my clerk. I'd say, I'm kind of struggling here. I, I want to find a reason. I listened to the state here today. They're pretty darn compelling as to why there's no redeeming qualities. And Attorney Jones said something really interesting during his sentencing remarks. You know, for everyone in this courtroom, the defendant, the defendant's family, to Mr. Poza, to his family, to all of Lynn's friends, even the detectives maybe, but probably less for them. This is the most important case. That's why you get people like Jim Kelleher saying, I want life without the possibility of parole and you get um, a request for leniency from those on your side. That's very typical. But what he said, what Attorney Jones said, and what he talked about is we look at the system of justice. We have to look at the degrees of homicides. To look at the cases really based on my experience, right, in other homicide cases, what's come through this county, and just generally kind of what we know in the justice system. And that really kind of stuck with me. And he said to strip the defendant of any eligibility would be too harsh in this case. I'm paraphrasing. And that we should trust the system because it's not an automatic. All it is is an eligibility. made me think. I know you're roughly 40 years of age. I thought about making you eligible at 62 years, meaning 62 years of initial confinement. I thought, well, at 40, I don't know that, you know, I would put her into triple digits. And I thought about what others have said in terms of, you know, you're less of a risk when you get older, especially if you're in your 70s, 80s, whatever. And I don't want to, you know, unduly depreciate the seriousness of you taking the life of another person. And even though I think you're completely diabolical. 
and I think this was planned, and I think you have evil in your heart. When I look at what else I've seen through my tenure, when I think of the system as a whole, I think this is one of those cases that it would not unduly depreciate the seriousness of the offense to make you eligible for extended supervision at some point. So then the question becomes, at what point? I think for me, it's important to think about how old Lynn was when her life was cut short and she was 62. Under the statute, the earliest I could consider eligibility is 20 years. Now, this is not what I would call minimums eligibility case. You have a prior record for four felonies. You've been to prison previously. You've been revoked twice while on extended supervision. You have issues with conforming your conduct to the rules and expectations that are placed upon you by the justice system. However, it's your first violent offense. You don't have a history of harming people uh, physically, assault behavior, certainly not a prior homicide, not even like an OWI homicide or anything. You just have that prior OWI first. Knowing that I believe consecutive sentences for those thefts are important, and I'll get to the reasoning why. On the first degree intentional homicide charge, count one, I'm going to impose a life sentence with the possibility of extended supervision after 30 years. That would make you, without the theft charges, close to 70 years of age, older than what Lynn would be today. Physically older, I think 30 years is a pretty significant amount of time. But my target is really 80 for you. That is why on counts two and three, you're going to serve maximum sentences consecutive to count one and consecutive to each other, because I think to do anything other than that, given your prior forgery and misappropriation, <clears throat> felony convictions, and your lack of a good track re record while on extended supervision would be to unduly depreciate the seriousness of those offenses. But I really looked at this, and my goal here was to kind of hit that target, and that's how I structured it, and that target being to make you eligible closer to a point in time when you are 80 years of age. I think the criteria that I have when I think about the, not just the seriousness, seriousness of the offense, that, but the need to protect the public, that's one of the key factors here as well. You've demonstrated that not only for family members and people that you love, but other strangers like the your prior record shows with the patients from the clinic at which you worked and the mom of the person you lived with, there's really not anyone who's safe from you when it comes to your willingness to steal, to defraud. You'll craft fake documents. You'll try to cover up your tracks. You'll justify it. And then you'll blame others in the process when you get caught. But there's other things I need to go through in terms of the sentencing, um, in terms of conditions for extended supervisions and, and conditions of your sentence. Obviously, there's a, some things I need to go through through the statute, but I'll go through them. You have to provide a DNA sample. If you've not previously done so, there's DNA surcharges on all three counts, 250 each. There's payment of court costs for each count. I am going to order costs pursuant to 973.06 sub 1 sub B in the amount of $16,728.74 payable to the Waukesha County District Attorney's Office uh, for the expert witness who testified in this case. 
we'll go through restitution more specifically uh, in a moment, and I realize it will be subject to a request for a hearing if made at the end of this hearing, uh, but I do believe uh, restitution as set forth in the uh, memorandum and affidavit submitted by I take that back. It's not, I don't think it was signed as an affidavit, but there's a memorandum and supporting documentation from attorney Beth Taylor detailing $386,646.01 is appropriate for all of the reasons that are expressed in that memorandum. I, I will frankly take judicial notice. She'll be incarcerated for quite a period of time and will not be employed. I don't think that's disputed, but... Um, I also believe it's appropriate for this court to set up an escrow account um, under 949.165. It is the express intent of this court to limit, if not make impossible, the ability of the defendant to profit in any way from the crimes she has been convicted of in this case and to use monies received as a result of the commission of these crimes, whether past, present, or future, to pay restitution as ordered herein and to compensate the victims. In other words, this court is relying upon Wisconsin State Statute Section 949.165 to order the establishment of an escrow account as a legal means to ensure the victims are compensated from the fruits of these serious crimes. The court finds an order for an escrow account is appropriate under the statute for payment of restitution, as well as court costs, fees, and surcharges, and for costs associated with prior or future legal representation, et cetera, under the statute. That's not an exhaustive list. The statute's pretty clear on what is uh, maybe paid. There is no doubt in the court's mind that homicide and felony theft are serious crimes under sub 1 in 949.165 and that the estate of Lynn Hernan represented by the personal representative Anthony Poza are victims under 950.02 sub 4. Not only is restitution to be paid as any condition of her sentence and extended supervision but it's to be paid before costs or fines and these financial obligations shall be collected pursuant to state statute and as provided with that escrow account that I'm setting up as well. She's to have absolutely no contact with Anthony Poza or any family members of his. She's to not gamble or have any contact at any casino. She is not to possess another person's personal identifying information, including but not limited to a driver's license, social security number or card, credit card or number, etc. She is to have no employment or service as a caregiver, whether paid or unpaid. She's to complete all other programming as deemed appropriate by the Department of Corrections. Within 48 hours of this hearing, she is to notify her attorney, meaning Attorney Jones, of the location of Lynn Herman's remains. And within 48 hours of that notification, those remains are to be turned over to the state of Wisconsin via their victim witness, who shall then turn them over to Anthony Poza. want to look through my notes, make sure I didn't overlook anything I wanted to address here today. I wanted to say this as well to... Judge, I can provide that location now if the court wants. Please do so on the record. Yes, my, it, my clients indicated that her mother's in possession of those remains. Do we know if the Jennifer Flowers in the hallway... We'll check. 
she is, she's to be brought in. I want to order her to turn them over. If the state would like a written order, please submit one and I'll uh, order that Jennifer Flower, um, who is in possession of the remains of Lynn Hernan, turn those over to the Waukesha County District Attorney's Office. Um, would you be willing to serve that upon her, Attorney Nikolai, within 48 hours of being served with the court order? All right, thank you. I, I wanted to um, say a couple of acknowledgments to Mr. Poza, his mom, and the rest of Lynn's friends. And I know that at times this has been frustrating. I appreciate the sentiment here earlier today, but I, I hope I did my best to bring this case to a conclusion and that by, and through this case, this trial, and today that you can finally have some closure and begin healing. I know that it's frustrating. It's frustrating for a lot of people, whether it be a defendant or a victim, to go through a court process. It doesn't always go as quickly, and as one thing I will agree with the defendant is that it is going through a court case and a trial is nothing like what you see portrayed in a dramatization. I often tell juries that, that you cannot get, try a case and get a verdict in an hour. That's drama. And the rules of evidence oftentimes prevent certain things from coming in that a, one party or the other might want in. And the flip side of that is sometimes it allows for questioning that may seem intrusive and violative. And I, I appreciate everyone's patience um, as we went through this process, you know, I, I would remind everyone, I mean, the case was filed in 2021. There needed to be a preliminary hearing. That was ultimately, um, once we got through the arraignment process and the case came before me, we had a trial scheduled in relatively short order for February of 2023. And then uh, there was a request by the defense for an adjournment. And with reluctance, I granted that. And originally we had uh, parts of six weeks needed to be scheduled depending on how we started and whatnot. And you can't just find five weeks, six weeks on anyone's schedule without going out a significant amount of time. And, you know, I, we don't have attorneys Kukler and Galavis here, but, you know, from my perspective, everyone worked really diligently to find a time that worked that where we could put this case forward. Um, we had certainly... Um, a jury pool um, who are silent other than the written verdicts that they signed. And I hope in some respects I've given voice and recognition of the guilty verdicts that they uh, pronounced in this case. Um, found my note that I wanted to reference earlier, and I know I've pronounced sentence, but when I talk about THZ and what it does to a person and why I believe in the series of events that I've described and um, how it was utilized in this case and why I believe there's, you know, evidence to support it being used for quite some time is that it impairs memory, it impairs judgment, it impairs inhibitions. It's a substance not routinely screened for and certainly not in 2018. It's a widely available over-the-counter. It's not a recreational drug. Um, it's used, as I indicated, either maliciously or as intended or it's ingested accidentally. That as a CNS depressant, um, it, cause, it can cause depression, drowsiness, hypothermia, which is low body temp, Brachycardia, which is slow heart rate. Hypotension. Apnea, which is the temporary cessation in breathing and coma. I didn't say this previously, but I had written a note to myself. I think it was referenced either by the state or by perhaps one of the individuals who made a statement, but I think it was Attorney Sitzberger, 
You know, Lynn Herndon was left to die on her own. What I wrote is this, that she was dosed, and the defendant left her to die alone. Why leave? If not a homicide, you needed a window of opportunity to claim Lynn Hern Hernan committed suicide. I just want to make a further record that while I didn't reference it with specificity in my sentencing remarks, I obviously had referenced kind of generally uh, the PSI, the private PSI certainly relied upon those in getting background information for uh, Ms. Kershewski, uh, referenced um, my reference to the 20 years was obviously to the private PSI as well. Uh, the state's PSI uh, did not make any specific recommendation on the homicide otherwise, other than noting it's life, um, that's mandatory life under the statute, and then made a recommendation that I deviated from or at least did not agree with as to counts two and three. I do want to state with some specificity the restitution that I ordered. I gave the total amount, but it's broken down as follows. Uh, for funeral expenses, $3,707.48. For the personal representative representative's fee, $2,947. For the cash withdrawals and checks from the estate checking account, $54,689.53. <clears throat> For payment from the estate to inheritance funding, $14,000. The payment from Croak, Gonzalez, Eckerly, and Martinson in the amount of $4,700. Um, additional fraudulent estate expenses as detailed in the memorandum by Attorney Taylor, totaling $42,425.14. Attorney's fees incurred by the state, this includes actual attorney's fees that have been incurred and an estimate of future attorney's fees, which I find to be reasonable under the circumstances of $18,149. I agree with the reasoning in this memorandum that this is not, uh, this is different from uh, normal attorney's fees. These are fees that would not have been incurred but for their fraudulent activity uh, related to the probate case of the defendant or by the defendant. Um, Mr. Poza, as the personal representative and victim under the statute, is he may seek and has sought compensation for time away from work, totaling $1,680. And there's additional payments to the defendant from the BMO Harris account, totaling $244,347.86 for that total of $386,646 and a penny. Um, I'll find that uh, this total amount of restitution has been established by clear and convincing evidence uh, based upon the trial exhibits and testimony and as set forth in the attached supporting documentation in document number 616 uh, filed with this court. Now, I indicated earlier uh, Attorney Jones, that I would certainly, if requested, schedule it further uh, for a restitution hearing. I don't know if you're in a position to tell me that today, but I'd certainly give you some time if you want. My, my question to the court would be if the court's considered, and I'm sure you have, I just didn't hear it on the record, the factors under 973.20 sub 13, the ones I set forth in my letter. Yes, I think I might have only referenced uh, her ability to pay. I took judicial notice of the fact that I've given her a life sentence with the eligibility for parole or extended supervision after uh, 30 years with the consecutive sentences. That's obviously, sorry, it's, yeah, 40 years after that. Let me just find your, find that letter, and I will add to that if I feel appropriate. I guess my point, Judge, while you're looking, is if you've considered those factors, which, like I indicated, I'm sure you have, I think that would be the sub and substance of the argument I'd be able to offer at a restitution hearing. So if they've been considered, I don't think that there's more to argue. I will speak more on uh, part three. I obviously ordered that escrow account, and what I believe 
um, is a very real possibility when you look at the present and future earning ability of the defendant. I'm certainly aware that uh, organizations such as Law and Crime, Core TV, um, 48 Hours, um, I believe also AARP, all intend or have expressed interest in the records or writing articles or other things. I believe there's a very real likelihood or possibility uh, for um, there to be potential income flowing to Ms. Kershevsky as it relates to her story. That's why I um, ordered the escrow account, and so I, I considered that. Um, obviously, she has no dependents, so that I don't need to consider sub four. Um, I've obviously considered the total loss suffered by any victim. Uh, I've gone through that. Um, I'm well aware she really has no financial resources at this time, but I do believe there's the very real potential uh, based upon the public and media interest in this case um, I also take into consideration that even with such a significant amount of restitution ordered and the way the statute reads about the payment of, of costs and restitution from prison monies, there's a cap on that. Um, and it's not um, something I would deviate from in this case. I think it's appropriate. Um, and um, so I've considered that as well. Then I'm not requesting an additional hearing. All right. Um, anything else from you at this time, and then I'll turn to the state. No, Your Honor. I know I have a few warnings to get through and all of that, but before I get through that, is there anything the state has? Your Honor, we are in the process of filing that order for the production of Lynn Hernan's remains, and then we'll obviously uh, keep the court informed of when that's served on Ms. Flower. All right. All right, Ms. Kershevsky, you have been convicted of three felonies. That means you may not vote in any election until your civil rights have been restored. You may not possess a firearm that is a felony punishable by a fine of up to $25,000 and imprisonment of up to 10 years. You may also not possess body armor. Um, and for a first offense, that would have a potential fine of $50,000 and imprisonment of up to 15 years, and for any second or subsequent offense, a $100,000 fine and a 25-year period of imprisonment. You also have 20 days from today's date to appeal the decision of the court. Good luck. That does conclude the hearing today. Please follow the direction of the bailiffs in terms of exiting from the courtroom. Um, and I'll look for that order. Make sure Attorney Jones sees it first. Thank you, everyone. Understood.